welcome to Indian Hill Church. We are so glad you've chosen to worship with us online this morning. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Lord of all power and might, the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name, increase in us true religion, nourish us with all goodness, and bring forth in us the fruit of good works. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. but against the rulers, against the authorities, against cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, Put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit of, at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, the message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am, a, am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. It was 
such a bizarre juxtaposition. Seeing sweet, innocent children talking about putting on armor for battle. Two weeks ago, we held our annual vacation Bible school. And the banner verse for the week was from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Each of the grade levels were divided up into knights from the North Castle. The kindergartners were bishops. The first graders were squires. The second graders were journeymen and women. And the third graders were chancellors. Preschoolers were either dragons or knights. And so each day, these brave knights began the day with music and challenges from Armorer Amy, our own Amy Clark, and Sparky the Dragon, Phil Clary, complete with their British accents. The brave knights were sent out on a quest each day around our beautiful campus in search for the armor of God. The armor of God being the belt of truth, the breastplate of justice, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, and the helmet of salvation. They did this each day through music and dance, recreation and crafts, a reenactment of the Bible story, and snack. We explored the familiar stories from both the Old and the New Testament as we discovered different pieces of God's protective armor. Now this may sound a bit over militaristic as children were challenged to armor up, to be strong, but I want to point out that this armor isn't like the armor of Fortnite or real military battles, for God's armor is a very different type of armor. The setting for the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus was born out of this young church being threatened. The fledgling church was in Asia Minor, and the young Christians had enemies all around them. The Gnostics, the Judaizers, the Romans all wanted to squash this young Christian movement. So Paul writes a, a message of encouragement. And he uses a militaristic image, a body armor, and he subverts it. He assigns these common parts of military armor, the belt, the breastplate, the sword, the, sword, the shield. But he gives to them very different values. Values of truth and righteousness and spirit and faith. Paul transforms this image of armor as a symbol of strength and self-reliance into a metaphor of utter dependence upon the strength of God. The Apostle Paul knew that the young Christians were living in difficult world. It was very hostile toward them. And so in a twist, notice that he is not preparing them to go out and be aggressive. Instead, the body armor of God is much more defensive in nature. It is for protection from a world that did not share the same values as the church. That God's sense of justice, grace, and peace, and love had enemies. Enemies that wanted to squash it. And so this armor was more for protection than it was for the offensive. You see, the Apostle Paul knew all about power. And he knew that humans distorted power. And that distortions of power like to thrive in the dark, full of secrets and violence and seeking to drive a wedge between people by promoting fear and suspicion. On the other hand, the strength of the Lord and the non-armor armor that would accompany these young Christians into the world sought to live in peace and love, grace and mercy, 
with an absolute trust on the power of God. It sounds all a bit naive, doesn't it? That our world today is, is absolutely no different. Crime and gun violence, distrust of everything from science and politics, government officials and school boards. No matter what is going on, it seems that everything has become contentious. Everything from our elections to whether we should wear a mask or not, whether we should be vaccinated, you name it. It has become politicized and divisive. And just like the Apostle Paul didn't have to be convinced that the world was a hostile place, Paul wants us to understand that as we go out into the world, we're not going out for a fight. We're going out to engage, but we're not going alone. For Paul knew that the church could not hide out. The church couldn't stay in the catacombs and still until the storm passed. For he knew that the only hope for the young startup church was to go out into the world and engage it. Paul was encouraging these young Christians at Ephesus to find true strength, to find their security in the ways of God. And so his words from Ephesians 6 offer for us a very different understanding of armor. Instead of putting on the armor of God to enter the fray in an aggressive way, attacking those who don't agree with us, the way of God is very different. Be careful out there. Engage in a very different mindset. Lead with love instead of fear. Engage the world with confidence and encouragement, not out of being afraid. Throughout the history of the church, the church has written statements of belief. We call them either confessions or we call them catechisms. And in particular, the Heidelberg Catechism, written in 1563, was a statement of the Protestant churches as they broke away from the Roman church. And one question in particular in the Heidelberg Catechism says, what is your only comfort in life and death? And the church leaders came up with the answer that I am not my own, but I belong in body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. This is a summation of the armor of God. It is strength beyond us. We are connected with God through Jesus. And so the Apostle Paul's encouragement to the young church at Ephesus and to you and to me today, this invitation to armor up is not for an aggressive fight in the way of being armored up in the military sounds. Instead, it means armor up, belong in body and soul and life and death to God. This means taking up a different set of tools. Instead of the armor of fear, we're invited to put on the whole armor of God. The armor is very different than the armor of the world. For God's armor is the belt of truth instead of tactical cargo pants. The breastplate of righteousness instead of tactical chest plates. Shoes that make us ready to lead the charge for the gospel of peace instead of assault boots. The shield of faith instead of a riot shield. The helmet of salvation instead of a ballistic assault helmet. The sword of the spirit is much different than an AK-47 assault rifle. So you see, the armor of God is so very different than the armor of the world. The God's way of thinking, and it's very different than aggressive forms of attack. They really don't keep us safe. Instead, they keep us afraid and scared. So you see, the only way to live as people of God, the church, you and me, the body of Christ, means suiting up an armor that engages the world, 
not fights it. But as you and I both know, the world today is a very different place. The world today seems to ignore the gospel rather than fight it. The Bible, the Christian faith, the church are irrelevant at best and the foundation of oppression at worst. So the culture doesn't waste a lot of its time or energy fighting us. They've moved on, which makes this armor of God all the more subversive. Cynics have said that the church has already lost the battle. I'm not ready to throw in the towel yet. I believe that following Jesus is important, or I wouldn't have given my life to it. But how do we stand a chance? How do we engage the world today? When we all know that being a Christian today is not natural, and it's certainly not easy. It's tough out there. You know it, I know it. For the world lives by very different slogans, very different vision, speaks a different language than the church does. So we begin by gathering together. We offer each other encouragement as we worship God together. We speak about our faith. We sing songs to praise God. We do this in spite of the world that acts as if there is no God. We speak to one another as beloved sisters and brothers in Christ when the world tells us to live as strangers. We pray to God to give us what we cannot get by our own efforts. We pray to God in spite of a world that teaches us to be self-sufficient and all-powerful. In our world, what we do on a Sunday morning seems really odd and irrelevant. But to us, it's a matter of life and death. It's easy to get caught up in the very different types of arm races we face in life. We learn to defend ourselves with words even more than we use our fists. We are more defensive and more angry than we ever were before, and we don't even have to use a sword or a gun. We set up perimeters and gated communities to keep other people out. And then one day we wake up and realize that we're all alone. We're armored to the hilt and we have weapons to destroy, but we are alone. That's not what God wishes for us, the church. Instead, we armor up to engage the world, not withdraw from it. We might survive a bit behind a gate or a wall, but that's no way to live. That's not what God wants. That's not what God needs from us, his people. So in the end, what we take from Paul's message is encouragement. Encouragement to the young church at Ephesus and encouragement to us today to move beyond our fears, to remember that we are not simply on our own, but we belong in body and heart and soul, in life and in death to Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. So friends, armor up. Armor up and know that as we go forth from this place, we do not go alone. May it be so in your life and in mine. Amen.
today. As gracious and loving God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for this day and the precious gift of life. Most gracious God, today we pray for our community. As schools are back in session, students and teachers are hitting their strides. We're making new friends and learning new things. So gracious God, we pray this day for our schools, for principals and administrators, for teachers and students, for cafeteria workers and bus drivers and all those who make the school day happen. O oh Lord our God, hear our prayer. We pray for our community. We pray for the village of Indian Hill, for surrounding communities, for the city of Cincinnati, state of Ohio, for our great nation and for all the world. As we continue to be ravaged by now a Delta variant, we pray for all those healthcare workers. We pray for the sick and the hurting. We pray your healing touch to be upon them. Gracious God, in the quiet of this moment, hear our prayers for the sick and the hurting. O Lord, our God, hear our prayers. We are also mindful of the needs of others, for the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, for the unemployed, for the poor, for all those in need of so much more than they have at this moment. Help us to be mindful. Help us to lend a helping hand and to offer out of our abundance. Gracious God, in the quiet of this moment, hear our prayers for those in need. O oh Lord our God, hear our prayers. We pray for the dead and the dying, and for those that are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, for those families in the midst of grief. Gracious and loving God, hear our prayers, and in the quiet of this moment, as we lift them to you for the dead and the dying and grieving. O oh, loving God, hear our prayers. We pray for the church, that we may be your hands and your feet here on earth. Guide us and direct us and help us to armor up to do your work in this world, not out of fear, but engagement. For this and all of our prayers we ask in Jesus' name, who taught his disciples to pray as we now boldly pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.